So my name is Ian Bushfield. I'm here from the British Columbia Humanist Association. I was uh, invited, I guess, by Jim and Jean, and they passed my name along to Elder College, who said, why don't you come and talk about humanism, atheism, and general non-religious worldviews in the class about religious worldviews. And I think that's important because I don't think we should restrict discussions of faith and interfaith and multi-faith and those kind of discussions to just those who believe in God. I think it's equally important to include those who don't. So this is the symbol of humanism. It was created in 1950s by a design competition. In the UK, you will see this more frequently when you go, say, to a, a funeral home where they offer different uh, celebrants. They will sometimes have this alongside the Christian cross, the Jewish, the Star of David, and other religious symbols. It's not seen much in North America, I think, because the humanist groups here haven't been as successful as British humanists. So a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about, I've stolen from British humanists because they have some fantastic materials. First of which, I'm going to start with a little video that they produced. It's Creative Commons, so I'm not actually breaking copyright by using this. Uh, but it features Stephen Fry, so it's fantastic. What makes something right or wrong? Some people believe that what is right and wrong never varies from situation to situation, and that it can be expressed in constant and unchanging commandments. They often look to religious texts, or authorities to discover what they think a god wants them to do. A humanist view of morality is different. Humanists do not look to any god for rules, but think carefully for themselves about what might be the best way to live. This approach means we have always to be empathetic and think about the effects of our choices on the happiness or suffering of the people, or sometimes other animals, concerned. We have to respect the rights and wishes of those involved, trying to find the kindest course of action or the option that will do the least harm. We have to consider carefully the particular situation we find ourselves in and not just take any rule or commandment for granted. We have to weigh up the evidence we have available to us about what the probable consequences of our actions will be. This way of thinking about what we should do is explicitly based on reason, experience and empathy and respect for others, rather than on tradition or deference to authority. It might sound hard, but luckily most of us do it most of the time without really thinking about it. Morality is not something that comes from outside of human beings, gifted to us by an external force like a god. When we look at our closest relatives in the animal world, we see the same basic tendencies we recognise in ourselves. Affection, cooperation, all the behaviour needed to live in groups and thrive. It is clear that our social instincts form the basis of morality and that they are a natural part of humanity. Of course, that is not the end of the story. The long experience of tens of thousands of years of human beings living in communities has developed and refined our morality, and we are all the lucky inheritors of that hard work. But it does not mean that there are not people who do harm or make bad choices. But ultimately, morality comes from us, not from any god. It is to do with people, with individual goodwill and social responsibility. It is about not being completely selfish, about kindness and consideration towards others. Ideas of freedom, justice, happiness, equality, fairness and all the other values we may live by are human inventions. And we can be proud of that as we strive to live up to them. So that's one of a series of four videos I produced, and if you're interested, I'll pass around a sign-up sheet that I can send you a bit more information with links to the other ones, as well as tons more literature and whatever else. Uh, not as an advertisement for my group, but just for your benefit. If you want to join the group, you absolutely can. A bit more about myself. I grew up in Alberta. I grew up in southern Alberta on a farm, but I grew up in a non-religious household, so where a lot of my friends did go to church, I know rural Alberta has that sort of stereotype, I guess sort of like Chilliwack of being a very evangelical, conservative Christian area. It never really occurred to me that people believe differently. I sort of just grew up not atheist, not anti-religious, but just sort of secular. We didn't talk about God in my household. We didn't go to Mass. We celebrated Christmas, 
but it was more about Santa and presents and family and food than the birth of Jesus Christ. And same with Easter, we celebrated Easter, but it was about skiing and Easter eggs and the bunny. <laughs> and I like that, but I was a kid. I still like that. Uh, I remember at one point in my high school, I was taking biology, and my teacher said, all right, it's time for the evolution unit. And I know that you might all have your personal beliefs, but you have to put those aside for now and just learn this, at least for the test. And this was the first time any of my science classes had sort of a caveat in the front, and that sort of struck me as weird. It wasn't something I was used to, because I went to a public school and we didn't have any class or any of that, so it was just, I didn't get it. I wasn't really thinking about the wider questions that not everyone believed in evolution. And then I got to university and I took engineering physics because I liked science and I didn't know what to do with myself. And it seemed interesting. I went to engineering and then I went to the most interesting but most esoteric of the engineering disciplines, engineering physics, just to try to learn more. I'm not doing that now because it got too hard. <laughs> but what I found at the University of Alberta where I went was I walked around clubs fair and there was a club for people of every faith, and I think that's fantastic. There were multiple Catholic clubs, there were Jewish clubs, there were multiple Muslim clubs, there were evangelical, there were multiple evangelical Christian clubs, depending on which group you identified with and how you wanted to involve yourself in that. I thought that was great, but where's my voice? Like I didn't I don't identify with any of these. So I was speaking with some friends and we decided to start a group called the University of Alberta Atheists and Agnostics. And so we launched this club just to basically have a sort of social meetup not to disparage anyone who did believe in God, but just to sort of get together and go, well, what do we all agree on? What do we want to discuss? And that went really well. We put up a table at Club Square and had 300 people sign up in the first week, where some clubs struggle along with like 10 or 15 people. So that showed there was an appetite for a community, and that's what I think humanism really is, is about community. So I finished my undergrad degree. I came to Vancouver, and I went to Burnham, or uh, Simon Fraser University in Burnaby. I did master's in physics, and that's when I learned physics gets really hard, and science is actually kind of boring <laughs> when it's that hard. I really like reading and learning about the science, and I can grasp most concepts, but the actual day-to-day -day haul of science is very methodical, very dry, and it takes a long time to actually get to a result. But in the meantime, I was still involved in other clubs. I was involved in just like the student groups, I was involved in the SFG Skeptics, a similar kind of club to what I started in undergrad. And I got involved in the BC Humanists, and I liked volunteering. And so that's how I sort of shifted from academia into the role I'm in now. I did live for two years in England, because my wife wanted to teach there, and I found a job at a charity called Science About Science that just promotes better use of science and evidence in public policy. And that was just something that still fit my worldview. But England has its own set of issues and we missed Vancouver, so we came back. And now I'm back with the BC Humanist Association and here today. So I wanted to start off actually with just a little bit of a quiz. Not, it, there's no passing or failing in this quiz, but it's just to sort of see for yourself, and I don't expect you to answer this publicly or you know, discuss with your neighbor, you can have whatever position you want. But just to sort of see where you sit. Are you more humanist or are you more theistic, supernatural, religious? So this quiz also comes from the British Humanist Association, and generally you take it online, and it just gives you a score at the end. If you don't have a pen and paper, there's only about seven questions, so just remember whether your answer is one, two, three, or four, and try to count up how many of each of those you get. Do your best. If you don't, don't worry. I think you'll get the pattern. So the first question, meaning in life, where does it come from? Does it come from nowhere? Is there just no meaning in life? Or does it come from a higher power, a god, something supernatural? Or does meaning in your life come from goals, ambitions, hobbies, and projects? Or perhaps you think meaning in life comes with just how you connect with others and your emotional feelings and community. One, two, three, or four. I won't tell you my answers, but you know, yes. uh, When I die, where do you think you go? Will you go on to another place? Will you be reborn into a new body? Or do you see no evidence that there's any life after death? So. Death is just the end? Or do you just not know? And so you're just going to stay agnostic and biblical. What do you need for something to be true for you? Does it need to be told to you 
by an authority or come from a sacred text, something religious, very traditional? Or do you just feel it? Do you just know something's true because it's got to be true, you know? That's just how the world works. Do you believe something because trustworthy people tell you they've seen the evidence for it and they've judged it to be valid? Or do you personally need to see the evidence before you believe it's true? What are your thoughts about the universe? Is it natural? Uh, is there a supernatural layer on top of everything we experience in the day-to-day life? Do you think the universe was created as part of a supernatural plan or a divine plan? Is there a purpose to the universe? Or do you think it's purely natural? What we see and experience and interact with is probably all there is, and the best way we can sort of figure that out is through experiments and science. Shouldn't that be these questions? Mm-hmm. On the question of a god, do you think there is one? Yeah. Or do you think there's lots? And do you think there could be male, female, fairies, all the other being involved? Or do you see no evidence, so you sort of hedge your bets and you're not sure? Or do you just see no evidence, so you say probably not? Or you could take this even further and just go, I see no evidence, therefore no. Uh, when we talk about religion and government, do you think the government should reflect the majority religion of the country? So if everyone, if most people in Canada are Christians, should our government be a Christian government? In the Middle East, where most people are Muslim, should it be a Muslim government? Or should the government try to stomp out religion and just tell them, you have no, you can have your private faith, but we would rather you not talk about it publicly? Or do you think government should just stay out of it, let people believe what they want, and try to just reduce discrimination. Not all of these have a four. So. Uh, how do you tell right from wrong? Do you look in a holy book or refer to a religious leaders? Do you just pick what works best for you and go with it? Screw everyone else. Or do you try to think about the con- possible consequences and their effects on others? There was a spoiler, I think, for this one in the video. When you look at a beautiful natural view, I think if we opened up these windows, you'd see the mountains out here. It's not the, it's a pretty good view. It's probably not the best view in Vancouver because we're spoiled, but we can relate to this. What do you think when you see that? Where, is, where do you think that comes from? Do you think it must have been designed by something supernatural, something greater than us? Do you think we've basically been granted dominion over it, so we should be able to do what we want? We can cut all those trees down, we can pull all the oil out, we don't have to think about consequences. Because it's ours. Do you think we should do everything we can protect, need to protect it and the natural environment for future generations? Or are you just sort of filled with self satisfaction? Not self satisfaction, but sort of a excitement and bliss about the world. You just enjoy it. That sounds a bit unfair to the ball Yeah, there, there's somewhere people might agree with two or three of them. It's not a perfect text, it's not a scientific text. Uh, they've actually improved it. I think in the past it was even more biased. Uh, other people, why should we treat others with respect? Because God created us all in his image and we're all God's creation and we should all just listen to each other. Do you think we should treat others with respect because they're useful? And if we treat them nicely then we can use them later for our own ends. Or do you think of people as feelings like you and you wouldn't want to hurt them because then it would be like hurting yourself? Or do you just think the world would be a slightly less bad place if we just do nice by each other? And I think this is the last one. What about animals? Should we treat animals however we want because they don't have souls and they were created for us? Do you think we should respect them because they're also part of that creation? Or do you think we should treat animals with respect because they can suffer? And again, obviously you can pick a couple. <laughs> five seconds to pick up your answer. You probably already know which side. I mean, there's some overlap. But if you're mostly three or fours, you're most likely a humanist. And that's why some of the three and four answers might have been like this one or this one. And same with the ones and twos. If you had a lot of ones and twos, you probably do believe in something supernatural. You do think there's something greater to this world, and that's okay. But humanism is generally predicated to me, humanism doesn't have to be atheist, but it generally makes belief in the supernatural irrelevant because we derive the way we interact with the world from our own reason and compassion 
and thinking about others. So there's lots of definitions about humanism because it's a movement filled with philosophers and thinkers and people who like to write a lot. And I prefer just like simple tweet level explanations that we can all just kind of get. And there's more arguing you can do about that. So I picked a couple of quotes that sort of describe it. This is what the American Humanist Association says. They say, humanism is a progressive philosophy of life that without theism or other supernatural beliefs affirms our responsibility, ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives and personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good of humanity. So you see bits in there from the quiz. Uh, less a focus on people and working with others. So it's not just a selfish idea. British Humanist Association, Brits are a bit more verbose, say humanism is approach to life based on humanity and reason. Humanists recognize that moral values are properly founded on human nature and experience alone, and that aims of morality should be human welfare, happiness, and fulfillment. Our decisions are based on the best available evidence, and our assessment of the outcomes is, and the assessment of the outcomes of our actions, not on any dogma or sacred text. So a key point in there is no dogma, which means even these can get revised a lot. So you'll notice that this was 2003, this was 2011. There are different formulations of humanism that have been put into manifesto since the 30s, and it keeps getting revised because they go, oh, well, we, we changed our mind about that, and that's okay. This is another one that the British Humanist, or the British Columbia Humanist Association actually has on our website. It's a bit longer than this, but this is a sort of summary of the 2002 what is humanism. Humanism is ethical, it's based on our own thinking about ethics. It's rational, it assumes that people can figure these things out. That is open to debate, but I think generally. Uh, we support democracy and human rights, so humanists have long been advocates for feminist equality, LGBT rights, and so forth. And I really like this one. Humanists insist that personal liberty must be combined with social responsibility. So it's not just that sort of selfish self-interest that makes a humanist a humanist. There is sort of a concern for the greater good, a concern for the wider society, and a concern for others. Uh, it's a response to the widespread demand for an alternative dogmatic religion. In that one, that one's really hard to summarize, and that's why the sentence is long, and the paragraph comes from is even longer. The idea is just there's a yearning in people for a community. Everyone experiences a little bit different, but the idea is a lot of people are becoming less and less religious, they're believing in fewer and fewer supernatural, or holding fewer and fewer supernatural beliefs, or they just don't feel comfortable with some of the religious institutions that are increasingly corrupt. I just watched Spotlight last night for the first time. And that's, I can understand how you could still be Catholic, but not Catholic. If you know what I mean. And that doesn't mean humanists are perfect. We have our own bad apples, but we try to avoid that building, that institutional hierarchy that protects rather than, that protects bad apples rather than the victims and survivors. Humanist value artistic creativity and imagination. We'll get accused, and as a, sci as a physicist myself, we'll get accused of being a very science, overly rational, overly skeptical, critical group. That's okay. The instructor didn't arrive, so I have to do this myself. Anyway. <laughs> uh, but there is a lot of humanism in art. Uh, Philip Pullman, uh, Stephen Fry, there are lots of great writers who are humanists, lots of great uh, actors, artists. It just doesn't get expressed as much here in Canada. Margaret Atwood would probably be considered a humanist, but we have to ask her if she tends not to identify as religious, if I recall correctly. And I think also like that this problem doesn't necessarily open this call himself a humanist because it's a rare word, because of branding issues. Uh, and it's a life stance that aims at the maximum fulfillment to the cultivation of ethical and creative living. Another mouthful that basically means life's worth living because we can make it better for each other. This is the summary I like. Humanism is reason, compassion, and hope. It's about thinking about the world, about science and evidence as the best way, best tools to our understanding. They're not perfect. It's about compassion, so everything we do should be grounded in trying to make life better for other people and animals. Humanism will also can get accused of being human being centric and speciesist. <coughs> and that's really easy to understand because the word human is in the title. Uh, but I do think it tries to reach out to other people and hope. 
so the, if we didn't have hope, there'd be no point to these other things because we'd just be nihilists. So humanists aren't nihilists. And that was the next thing I wanted to touch on just before I get into my brief and probably bad run through humanist and free thought throughout history, because I'm not a historian. Uh, humanism is not nihilistic. Uh, it's not communist or capitalist. Humanists tend to fall on the left of the political <coughs> spectrum, but there are <coughs> humanist conservatives who just think there should be a little bit more personal liberty. Uh, there are, of course, hardcore communist humanists as well. Humanist is not a religion, but it sometimes has to be interpreted that way for human rights legislation because our laws are very uh, poorly worded, and I'll get to that in some of the things that our group is up to these days. And I want to stress that humanism isn't anti-religious at its core. There are a lot of sort of anti-theists who sort of overlap with humanism, but I don't think our core mission as a movement is to denigrate people for believing in God or wanting to go to church. We'll criticize structures at our best, and we'll criticize institutions and holy books where they perpetuate discrimination, but I really don't like when we discriminate people. People, people are at the core. Right? So let's talk about history from a person who doesn't actually study history, has taken one history course in university, and we'll talk about <coughs> stuff on Wikipedia. <laughs> the first sort of inklings and writings that sort of question the almost assumed idea that there is a God surprisingly date back a long time. Up here I have sort of comparison of quotes showing that the golden rule, the idea you should treat others as you want to be treated, is almost universal. So you see it all across the Eastern religions. But what I want to talk about more is there are skeptics of theistic belief dating back to several hundred BCE or further, or BC if you prefer. It's the calendar we use. Uh, Confucius talked a lot about sort of just uh, Confucius, Buddhist, Taoist talk a lot about putting philosophy and putting that philosophy in person. And a lot of them were theistic, they believed in a supernatural realm, but a lot of their morality and their thinking about morality came from reason and the sort of thinking about it and just wondering about that. I haven't done a ton of studying it, I really want to study it more because I think it's fascinating, it's sort of Eastern ideas, because most of the history of free thought and everything I also cover is Western. Uh, but there's a lot of writing in Confucius. I met one person in Vancouver who was basically putting together all of Confucian writings that he thinks sort of follow into a sort of more modern, secular worldview. And there are a lot of people who support who are Buddhists, but also don't believe in supernatural. I think it's also important to point out that there are also Buddhists at the other end who are creating theocratic states and repressing other people, so no worldview is perfect. Uh, into the ancient world, you have people like Democritus, Epicurus, in ancient Greece, starting to question the idea of the supernatural. Uh, Cicero and others, Seneca and Socrates, we're all thinking about the world. There's, again, more things that are just a golden rule coming from that time. And actually, one of the strongest arguments against belief in God comes from Epicurus. In Epicurus would have been second century modern current era. But he basically says, if God is willing to prevent evil, but not able, then he's not omnipotent and do anything. But if he could prevent evil, but he's not willing to, and he's mean, he's malevolent. But if he's able to prevent evil, uh, if he's able to prevent evil, and willing to, then why is there any evil? Why does bad things happen? Is he, and if he can't do either of those things, then why do we even call him God? And you could argue about the sort of original sin idea, and the idea we need to redeem ourselves in his eyes, but this does sort of get to the heart of if there's evil, why is there supernatural? And I don't want to get into the theological debates <coughs> here, but I just want to sort of point out that these thoughts have been around. Like, the arguments in Richard Dawkins' books, which I'll get to, aren't new in any way. Some of them are dating back centuries, many of them even longer. So Epicurus sort of developed this 
one of his ideas on this. He talked also to a lot of sort of the, what were called the Greek atomists. There are people who believed that the world is made up of things called atoms, small, individual, indivisible particles. And that happened to be a really correct idea. Almost lucky, because the Greeks' way of approaching the world was just to think really hard and go, that must be it. It's only later we realize we sometimes have to test that idea, because sometimes you get it wrong. But some of them, by that sort of nature of just stabbing in the dark, sometimes literally when sitting in caves, works. So Epicurus came up with this idea that, well, there's no real reason for me to believe in the supernatural or in supernatural gods, so how should I conduct my life? And now when you hear people talk about Epicurean uh, philosophy, it's a lot of drinking wine, eating good food, sort of the <laughs> ideal lifestyle in the Mediterranean. Because they sort of switched from trying to appease the <coughs> malicious gods of the ancient Greeks to living for self-satisfaction. And it wasn't a perfect sort of worldview. Their hedonism has its issues. But it was sort of the first, I think, glimmer in the Western world of a humanist worldview, where the focus was on people rather than supernatural. Through the Dark Ages, uh, not much happened in Europe in terms of critical thought. There was a lot of penalties for speaking out against the church and religion and belief in God. But in the Arab world, there was actually a number of people that did speak up. Uh, here you see through sort of the you know, 100 to 1900, the golden rule appear again. And one uh, Arab scholar, there were actually several, but Abu Isa al warik questioned the divinity of Muhammad as Islam was starting to flourish. I sort of questioned the idea that just because Muhammad said some things that happened to be true didn't mean he had supernatural powers. He might have just been guessing. This is something you'd almost expect Richard Dawkins to say now, or someone more anti-religious. But this is 9th century CE when um, Islam was on the rise. He also sort of questions the idea that even if Muhammad was fulfilling these prophecies, he could have just known about them and then just did that thing to try to prove it. I mean, you can debate Abu Isa al warik about Islam or about Christianity, I'm not here to defend his belief or his specific argument. I'm just here to point out that these existed throughout time, and they're sort of little traces. And there's some actual great books that go through the history of questioning the religious or questioning belief in God. And it sort of ties how these ideas didn't just keep popping up. There's possibly threads between them. Like a lot of the Greek writings, I think, ended up in the Middle East, and that's how they sort of tied it together through to the Renaissance, we see the first use of the word humanism. And Leonardo da Vinci, I'm pretty sure, did believe in God. But he and his movement were sort of the first to de-sanctify the human body and the human form. And so instead of putting human beings on pedestal, they said, let's study man. Let's draw human beings as they are. Let's do it scientifically. Leonardo da Vinci did a lot of scientific writings. I saw a museum exhibit, I think it was in the uh, Vancouver Art Gallery, where it was all da Vinci's anatomical drawings. So he's most famous for the Mona Lisa and his paintings, which were, in their own artistic way, taking the supernatural out of art and putting humans at the front. But in his scientific approach, he said, let's start to just study people very specifically. And you had people like Giordano Bruno burned at the stake for heresy as the Inquisition started. Uh, Giordano Bruno, I actually saw this statue when I was in Rome. It's fantastic square. But he questioned the authority of the church. He questioned the supernatural. And he and others like Copernicus started to question the idea that the earth was the center of the universe. And many paid for it. We move from the Renaissance into the Enlightenment, and you get those ideas start to flourish. You have the salons of Paris where men like these, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Voltaire, and Baron de Holbach, who I only know a little bit about, but he actually, I think, is often nicknamed one of the like biggest names of the Enlightenment and atheism. So in terms of just promoting the idea that there is no God, a lot of his writings are very strong. 
But you have people like Jean-Jacques Rousseau and Voltaire promoting ideas of equality and rights of the individual as opposed to the state or the supernatural. And of course, this is like my one slide on the Enlightenment, but I could probably do a whole lecture on the Enlightenment if I studied up enough. Please don't quiz me on it. But <laughs> the idea started to flourish. And one thing that I found really fascinating was because of people like this, and I'm sorry I'm talking too much about men, I will have some women here in a minute. Uh, things started to happen, like during the French Revolution, they were really attacking the idea that the Catholic Church should be what we all listen to, at least in France. They were revolting against the, not just the authority of the state, but the Catholic Church in, in its power. And they actually launched something called the Cult of Reason. And that's a literal translation. I can't read this out. I think it's in French as well. And I only know a bit of French. But the basic idea of the Cult of Reason was that we should celebrate humanity and rationality and philosophy. And so they actually set up statues of philosophy and sort of worshipped them. So I think it went a little weird. But <laughs> things were weird during the French Revolution. The cult of reason was fascinating to me because it only lasted a couple of years and it sort of represented to me the first time people tried to get together on a basis of non-religion. So before that you had philosophical thinkers sort of talking about it and you had salons where they had philosophical clubs, but this was the first time you sort of had an attempt to replace church with something purely atheistic. Now Robespierre comes along and he led the, if you remember your French Revolutionary history, Robespierre is the one who led the uh, terror uh, when he just chopped off everyone's head who disagreed with him. He didn't like this because it didn't fit, he believed in God and he saw this as a competition for his French Republic. So he actually broke these statues down, shut all these, the cult of reason down, and established what he called the cult of the supreme being, because he wasn't Catholic, he still opposed the Catholic Church, but he still believed in a sort of deistic God, something created the universe in his mind. So the cult of reason was replaced with the cult of the supreme being, with the philosophical statues being replaced by prime mover statues or something. It's just sort of a fascinating thing, and I can't find enough history on this, like it's a very, it's only a little bit written, at least in English, but I have studied a bit, and I like, I like the story of it, it's interesting, even though a lot of people died in these tracks. After French Revolution, you move forward into the 19th century, and you start having a lot of people talking about non-religious ideas, and questioning, and being very skeptical of the world. Uh, Charles Bradlaugh was repeatedly elected in England, but when he got to London to sit in Parliament, they said, you need to swear an oath of allegiance to the Queen and God. And he said, well, I don't believe in God, so I can't swear that oath. And so there were multiple times he didn't take his seat after being elected. Uh, he was a liberal MP when the Liberal Party existed in the UK. Uh, I guess it sort of does today. But he basically fought for the rights of atheists at that time. And eventually, they changed it so you could swear an uh, affirmation, a secular affirmation, and still sit as an MP. You still have people objecting to the oaths that they have to swear in England. They're mostly North Irish Republicans who get elected and refuse to pledge allegiance to the Queen. So they don't take their seats. But I think he was one of the first to, to get elected and then say, I can't do this. And his people kept electing him, which is actually quite a um, testament to his popularity. Uh, Karl Marx is most famous, of course, for writing about capitalism and the problems he saw with it and how we should just have communal communist systems to work out. Those didn't work out. And some say it's because they didn't follow his ideas exactly. But I think that is a problem of its own. Uh, but he did write a lot about the problems of religion, his most famous one that gets taken out of context is religion is no good for the masses, but it's just sort of the idea that religion is often used to control people. And he sort of brought that out. Frederick Nietzsche called, got, said God is dead, he's famous for that, but he also just sort of brought human mind under um, consideration and started questioning that. And Robert Ingersoll at the same time uh, was a speaker in the U.S. and sort of brought in the U.S. it was sort of known as the golden age of free thought in the 19th century. 
and he went on lecture tours like Dawkins does today, not preaching but doing speaking tours about why he didn't believe in God, why people should be skeptical of religion, and really trying to bring that focus back on the people rather than the supernatural. So you don't hear much about him unless you talk to the right atheists in the US who are like, yeah, he was great. <laughs> I haven't actually read too many of his speeches, but he was sort of that historical narrator who would stand up there and already like I'm trying to do today. I mentioned women, and in the 19th century, I think the most powerful movement was the sort of suffragette, the start of the suffragette and the feminist movement, and a lot of the core of that in the US, it gets forgotten, they were atheists. Uh, Ernst Stein and Rose, uh, I believe was British, because I think I saw her grave in uh, High, Highgate Cemetery in North London, which is actually an unconsecrated cemetery where people like Karl Marx are buried. Karl Marx is buried in London for some reason. Uh, but she was a freethinker. She called herself a freethinker. She said she was an atheist. Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote about how religion subjugated women a lot. They had falling outs with a lot of the feminist movement later that was trying to build bridges because they saw religion as inherently patriarchal, at least the religions of the day. And they didn't want to involve religion in when they wanted to fight for the rights of women. And they didn't believe in God, so they didn't see the point. You see this still today, this sort of idea that religion hasn't been the best friend of women or equality. And there are feminists today who are fighting for it, and more men as well. Along, in, at the same time in the 19th century, you started having more uh, communal attempts. Uh, this was the Church of Humanity, which was started by Auguste Comte, the existentialist. I think this one is in France or Brazil, I forget exactly, but the idea was to create a church for people. So sort of, a lot of these took the idea from the cult of reason and said, yeah, we should have an alternative. The reason people are still believing in God in their mind was because they have a church, because they have that community where they get support, friendship, and compassion. So you started that one, and I don't know if it's still open. You also had the formation of what was called ethical society, an ethical culture society. Uh, here in London, this is Conway Hall, which was started by, founded and built by the South Place Ethical, South Place Ethical Culture Society. Okay? And this is the New York Society for Ethical Culture. Both of these buildings are still standing, still open. This is a modern picture, and I walk, went into this building a lot. They are essentially churches of atheism, churches of humanism. They're not called churches because we don't like that word generally makes a lot less uncomfortable. Uh, this one in the US was started by a man called Felix Adler, who really tried to promote the idea that ethical culture should, we should have a community that's focused on just doing better. So the Ethical Culture Society had a really, I think, good idea to start. It was never about attacking religion or attacking people's belief, but merely giving somewhere for people to come together and do good works. Like the Catholic Church does a lot of good works, like most churches do a lot of good works. I think the failing of the Ethical Culture Society and why you've probably never heard of it is because they spent so much time focusing on good works. I think the one in New York started a couple hospitals, started doing uh, trained nurses, and did a lot of compassionate work. They forgot to advertise. They forgot to actually do the getting more people in the door. And this has been sort of a continual problem with humanists movements and atheist movements as we get focused on, yes, we need to be better, we need to do some great things, and that's fantastic. I would never denigrate someone for trying to make the world a better place, but then they forget to actually go out and recruit the next generation. <coughs> Conway Hall is still run by the Ethical Culture Society, but it's also used by the thriving free thought secular movement in the UK. Um, that. Yeah, I'll come back to Conway Hall. So then into the 20th century, you have these sort of thriving different movements. You have ethical culture societies really starting to take off, and you have different thinkers in the US, John Dewey, Felix Adler, a few of those. And they get together, and they form the American Humanist Association in about the 1920s. <coughs> and, they, and they do whatever happens when you get a bunch of philosophers and thinkers together. They write a manifesto, and they go, this is going to change the world. 
the first Humanist Manifesto in 1933, and if you read it today, it sounds like a sort of communist, anti-religious propaganda piece because of who the thinkers were. And if you remember, after 1933, it was in the midst of the Depression. People were looking for radical changes, and the you know horrors of Stalin weren't public at that time, so they didn't know, I don't think, that there were challenges. I think they were hoping for maybe what ended up happening in Scandinavia. Eventually they got around and they wrote the second Humanist Manifesto and that was 1973 and then the third one in 2000, or there was a third one in 2003, there's the Amsterdam Declaration I showed you earlier in 2002. Uh, this one was written by a different group that's humanists like disagreeing with each other and splintering them, just like any religion, which is not a religion. Uh, so you had the American Humanist Association formed in 1923, International Humanist and Ethical Union formed in the 50s. The British Humanist Association actually took that name in 1957, but it took over, it came about from two pre-existing organizations that have been around since the early or late 1800s in 1896. And Humanist Canada founded in 1967, I believe 1968. Humanist Canada was actually predated by the Humanist Fellowship of Montreal and Victoria Secular Humanist Association, which both founded in the 50s. So it's been around in Canada since the 1950s. Those two groups came together to form Humanist Canada. And then the British Columbia Humanist Association formed in the 80s. That's a lot of history. It's not that important. Mm -hmm. But I'm just sort of giving you the idea. Go ahead. Can you give me an idea of what your meeting would look like? I mean, I'm just sure. going by the experience I'll, of the church one. I mean, the right. ministers up there, congregation. You know? I'll get to that. Oh, How about, does that work? Yep. All right, cool. So I'll talk a little bit more about the history in Canada. Humanist Canada was actually founded by this man, Henry Morgenthaler, who is one of the more divisive figures in Canada history, but for some a hero, for some a villain. He founded Humanist Canada, and all of his work in fighting for reproductive freedoms and fighting Canada's abortion law, going to jail over it, was premised on his humanism. You would even say that. Uh, if you don't know, Henry Morgenthaler survived, uh, he's a Jewish man who survived Holocaust camps in Germany, came to Canada and said never again, and really focused on trying to make the world better and fighting for in his view equality. So he would go to a province, open an abortion clinic, get arrested, and tell the jury, well, I know I did it. And the jury would say, well, but the law is unjust, so we're not going to throw you in jail. You're clearly guilty but we're going to find you not guilty because we don't agree with the law. And that actually is known as jury nullification. And because juries kept doing that to him, the federal government passed a law where defense counsels can't tell juries anymore that they're allowed to find someone not guilty when they are, if they don't agree with the law. So this is why I sometimes tell people, you are allowed to do that, because there's no law against me telling you until I'm a defense attorney, which won't happen. I like, I like legal and law stuff, but I'm going to be a lawyer. Uh, Henry Morgenthal died a few years ago, uh, kind of a sad for humanists, but he did fight for that all his life. So he, I think, overturned the law in Ontario, moved to Manitoba, did it again, I think he died in PEI, still trying to open abortion clinics there. Then 9-11 then happens, and there's this sort of outrage, I think, in the average person's mind that religion caused this. And I think that led to sort of prominence of these four individuals, or at least a few of them. You might not know who Dan Bennett is, and he's spoken less with them. But there have been lots of writings. Humanists, as I said, have a lot of philosophers and a lot of academics. So lots of books have always been written about atheism, about disbelief in God. But I think it took 9-11 happening, and then a couple books by the right people coming out to launch what was called the New Atheist Movement, which was really uh, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, and to some extent Daniel Dennett's books questioning not just belief in God, but the idea that believing in God is a good thing. So Dan Dennett called it belief in belief. Is belief in belief a good thing? And he said no. Uh, Richard Dawkins said all kinds of mean things about religion. Christopher Hitchens just said all kinds of mean things. Some, a lot of them very eloquently and funny. And Sam Harris just sort of questioned the religiosity and uh, they've all since gone, well, Chris Hitchens has died since due to his light book smoking and drinking. 
uh, then, then it's sort of just veered back into philosophy because that's what it's always been. And these two men get a lot of criticism for what they say on Twitter, and I tend not to agree with that stuff. So you know, they're shooting beyond their expertise. <coughs> but that really, their books really launched a sort of modern atheist movement, and that is sort of has influenced all those humanist organizations as they saw groups like my student group, I think, were successful in part because I founded it in 2007 sort of a few years after some of these books took off, I think it really launched a student movement at campuses across North America where you had university students really getting together and questioning whether we should whether we should organize as atheists and whether we should unite as that. And that I did found an atheist group. And now I think it's swinging back a bit. I think there's less of this sort of anger in the atheist movement and it's sort of dividing into a bit more of a Let's go back and talk a bit more about trying to make the world a better place. It's still sort of challenge religious privilege where it is. And of course, there are people who think these guys are right about everything. So that's the way the world works. So talking about modern, where we are today, when I say the pendulum swinging back, one thing that's really interesting is this. And this is a picture inside Conway Hall. It's about a 400 seat lecture hall. And this is something called the Sunday Assembly, started by this man, comedian Sanderson Jones. And this comedian, Pippa Evans, who sings a lot of songs, who are rather funny. Both of them are actually kind of press comedians, but then they got together and said, I think they were having a road trip a few years ago, maybe 2011, and said, what if there was just a church for atheists? Like, what if we could get together, sing songs, didn't have to believe in God, but just sort of had all the fun bits? <coughs> it's sort of, their idea was, if you have a shoe with a rock in it, you don't throw the shoe away, you just sort of dump the rock out keep wearing the shoes because it's comfy. So they liked the idea of church, but neither of them believed in God. They didn't really want to start a new atheist movement, but they accidentally did because they found out a lot of people want to sing Beatles and other pop songs in a group setting and have fun. So it actually attracted a lot of young people. I went to this one regularly in London. I also, which happens twice a week, or sorry, twice a month, not twice a week, because everyone's all in fear there. And I helped found one in Leeds when I was living in the north in England. And it attracts just a very young, energetic crowd that was a lot of fun. And what you found is when you get all these people together, they want to do more than just meet every month or every two weeks. And they start forming book clubs, and they form social groups, and they say, let's get together and clean up a park. And they do some of those good things and tell others that hopefully that common is doing. So that's one of the things that sort of answers your question. Our group doesn't do that. Oh, I realized my slides are over. Well, they're not out of order, but how I've been going with this. Oh, I'm doing really good on time. <laughs> I was like, I don't know if I'm going to rush through this and have like 40 minutes, which I figured we just had an awesome discussion. Um, I'll come back to this. That's about kind of the day. This is our group. So we do a lot. We have a weekly Sunday morning meeting in Vancouver at the Oakridge Senior Center because we get a really good rate there. Our meetings are more academic, so we have a sort of sit down, have coffee, chat with your friends and new people there, and then we have a lecture or a speaker or a video on some topic that's of interest, probably of interest to most of us. So that's not always religion, that's often something scientific or something philosophical. Um, this weekend we have, tomorrow, no, Sunday, we have someone speaking who's an SFU professor who's done research on nihilism and terror. In a couple weeks, we have another UBC researcher who just released a study about, he, his study was published in Nature, and it's about, did the belief in a punitive God, the idea that God is trying to you know, smite people, did that help society flourish? And he's got some evidence to suggest that. And he's going to talk about that. He's got published in Nature, so it can't be totally fine. Uh, we've had people talk about nuclear energy. We've had people talk about, um, founding critical thinking classes in developing countries. And we just sort of have that lecture and then we have a big discussion because everyone in our room has five opinions about everything. So it's just sort of that. Uh, this was one of the picnics we did because we like doing some more social events. We've been marching in the Pride Parade for a number of years in Vancouver. Again, as, we, as I said, we generally support the LGBTQ plus community because we don't believe people should be discriminated against for how they identify. Uh, 
we've been very supportive of the assisted dying movement in Canada. I've submitted it on our organization's behalf several briefs arguing that people should have the choice. Uh, there should be protections, but people should have the choice, just like Henry Morgan Toller fought for the choice to choose to end your life or choose to carry a baby to term or not, or a fetus to term. Uh, we're arguing these days that you should have a choice if you're suffering whether or not you want to continue. And we also want to perform marriages. Right now in Ontario and Scotland, humanists are actually allowed to perform weddings the way a priest would and solemnize it. In Scotland, they were allowed this about 10 or 12 years ago, and since then, it's become the most popular wedding outside of the civil marriages. So there are more humanist weddings happening today in Scotland than there are Catholic weddings or Church of Scotland weddings or any other kind. And the idea there is that you want, when you're having a marriage, when you're marrying someone, you want the person performing the ceremony to reflect your belief system and to sort of agree with you. And what's nice about humanism is we're not dogmatic, so we're allowed to modify the script and change it in any way to really reflect the couple. And so I did actually perform a wedding here in BC for some of my friends, and we had to have a marriage commissioner from the government sit in the corner and listen and sign documents. Uh, but it allowed me to work with my friends to really develop something meaningful about all three of us and that sort of union between the two. We also perform memorials, and I've done a few of those myself, where you just try to recognize the life of the person and the people who live on and celebrate that in a positive way. I'll come back to our campaigns. I hope that answers your question about what we do today, besides get really angry about a bunch of stuff and tell you about numbers and statistics, because I know that's what you're all waiting for. Uh, it's really hard to measure humanism, because no one knows what it is. And as I tried, and one of the points of taking that quiz at the start, and one of the reasons the British humanists put it on their website, is to just to suggest um, you, you might be a humanist and you don't even know it. Uh, so these numbers come from Statistics Canada. What's interesting is, the way Statistics Canada asks you about religion is they say, what is your religion or belief, even if you're no longer currently practicing? So when you look at numbers across Canada, that looks like a very religious province, a very Catholic province. But if you even just stereotypically think of your average Quebecer, they're not going to mass every week. There are plenty of Catholics still in Quebec, but it's not 86% of them. I have trouble believing that, especially since the fire revolution. These numbers for British Columbia, in 2001, we had 36% uh, was no religion. Actually, the largest portion when you break Christian into the relevant portions. And actually, Protestants should probably be broken down further because these ones probably don't agree with these ones. Even Catholics, these ones probably don't agree with these ones. And this is a lot. This other, I didn't want a bunch of tiny slivers. I'm not trying to wash over uh, the Jews. Jewish people, Muslims, Sikhs, but the fact is there's only one or two percent of each, and if I put them on here, it looks really bad. So I'm not trying to disparage them. Uh, however, in 2011, when they redid the survey, that number had grown from 36 to 44 percent. It's the only one really growing out of the big ones. Um, a couple of the smaller uh, Muslim Sikh communities are growing, but in percentage-wise, no religion is actually growing the fastest. The other problem with this number, if you'll remember the controversies over the last few years, the National Household Survey was voluntary rather than this one, which was mandatory. And I think this one went out to a third of households, but they all had to fill it out. This one went out to more households, but they didn't have to fill it out. And statisticians were really mad because that's not how statistics work. So I think this big number is still pretty good, it's still pretty accurate for what they ask, which again is if you're, even if you're no longer practicing biases towards making these highs bigger. Because of those bias, in 2013, the BC Humanist Association followed the lead of the British Humanist Association, who, where in England, they have a very similar, we think, bad question. And we put out our own poll. Now, our number was only 600 people, chosen at random by justice and marketing around the province. But we asked a more straightforward question. Do you participate or practice in a particular religion or faith? you can disagree with that being the best question. And that doesn't mean that these are all humanists. But when you ask it this way, 
it's only 33% of BC in 2013 was religious versus all of these ones. Uh, actually, Statistics Canada, when they asked this, some people, when asked, what is your religion? Answer atheist, answer humanist, or answer other. But each of those numbers is significantly smaller than no religion. Because when you ask people, what is your religion, you don't tend to say, I'm a, my religion is atheism. It's, it's sort of a bad answer to the question. Uh, so we asked people, do you participate in religion? And 33% said yes. We asked people, do you believe in a higher power? Now this can be phrased a lot of ways. You can say, do you believe in God? And that would get a slightly different number. But when we ask this, 70% say yes. 20% say no in BC. And those aren't actually rounded. That's about that. And then 9% just don't know. They don't know what that means. So 30% are questioning or like, don't believe in any higher power. And 70% do. Again, a God number might be a bit smaller because you have your stereotypical Vancouver Islander or Kitsilano resident who believes in this spiritual realm that might fit in here. But this is a reasonably high number, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, what fascinated me most is when we ask people, how often do you go to church or religious service, temple? These numbers are hard to read, but this is 68% say never. And only 15% say weekly or more. And then there's some in between. But like, this really shocked me. Uh, it's, we have the breakdowns for some of the cities, and Vancouver is, Metro Van is lower. Vancouver Island is lower. The interior is higher. It's all the stereotypes. With 600 people, we didn't have the granular detail. The Statist uh, Stats Canada has a bit more granular detail, but it doesn't ask fun interesting questions like this. Uh, so what else do we campaign on? As I said, physicians have been dying. We just generally, as a charity, one of our main aims is just to promote understanding of who we are and what we do believe in, and that's, I guess, why I'm here. Uh, we promote freedom of expression, because we think that it's really important to be able to discuss ideas to actually get to the bottom of what we do believe. Censorship is something we generally oppose. Humanists do take a wide range of views on questions like hate speech laws. Some are very against them, because they're very free speech. Others believe they are necessary at times to prevent discrimination. I fall a little bit personally more towards that end, but also generally support the right of people to criticize religious belief or belief in God. The right to blaspheme is something we're involved in. Promote humanist rights. Our humanist action campaign, that doesn't mean anything to you, but it's the basic idea of trying to get us more involved in the community. So running blood drives, so doing uh, shoreline cleanups, doing charity runs. Uh, we are trying to form more marriages and more ceremonies. One thing that's stopping us is the BC government and the law. As I mentioned, a lot of our laws are written in a very sort of biased way. In the BC, to perform a marriage, you either have to be a marriage commissioner who is hired and appointed by the government, or you have to be a religious clergy. And you have to be a recognized religion who appoints someone. So we said, can we be in that category and appoint our own people, because that would be fair. And they said, no, you're not a religion. You say, you say right in your constitution you're an alternative to religion but you can be an alternative to gasoline and still be a fuel. So we're looking into our legal options and we might be lobbying politicians. So if you know a politician who's friendly to humanist ideas and wants to get married, I know I'm asking the wrong place, but we're looking for that. We still support reproductive freedoms and we have generally opposed cities proclaiming right to life weeks because we don't think that cities should be taking a position against reproductive freedoms. We promote science a lot. Um, there are a lot of other good organizations doing a lot of work on that, so we do less, but we do support um, critical thinking and evolution in schools. I know in the 90s, the BC Humanists and some of our members were very active in fighting um, the attempts in the Abbotsford School District next door to try to get evolution out of the classroom and for creationism in the science classroom in public school. And so that's why there's now a policy in the Abbotsford School District that says, origin of life and they must teach the curriculum even if the students don't agree or the teacher doesn't agree but they're all allowed to have those beliefs and it's the most awkwardly worded but not objectionable policy because of those kind of battles. The other kind of things is you might remember a few years ago here in Chilliwack they were distributing Gideon Bibles to the students in public school and we fought hard to try to end that because we don't believe schools should be a vehicle for proselytization. They eventually changed their policy from they'll distribute Gideon Bibles to they'll distribute 
materials when asked. And then they just quietly stopped distributing them. So we talked about there's a win. And now we're looking at Abbotsford next door where we're still doing that. And in general, we promote secularism. So in the Trinity Western case, we don't think an organization that wants to be essentially operating in a public sphere as a university should be promoting religion to its students or forcing religious beliefs like they can't have same-sex couples in that university. That's where we fall on that.